that we have on various matters of the moment, uh, broadly construed operating under the rubric of um, <coughs> democracies in crisis. We've had something on impeachment, something on Brexit, we have a couple coming up, one on taxation politics, another on homeless. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, electoral manipulation. You can obviously use your own vocabulary, whether you consider it electoral engineering, outright political fraud, you can pick whatever word you see is appropriate, but we're obviously raising here appropriately, Super Tuesday, uh, questions of uh, electoral gerrymandering, voter suppression, uh, census politics, foreign intervention in elections, these sorts of issues. Uh, and we're drawing upon, as we do typically in these conversations, our faculty who have expertise uh, in this area. So I'm going to introduce all of them, each of them, very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time and you want to hear them as soon as we can. Uh, so beginning uh, with Eric Schickler, who's in the political science department here, is the McDermott Chair in Political Science. He's written extensively on American politics, uh, on, uh, among other things, um, uh, the filibuster in American politics. He's written about uh, a book, a very influential book, investigating uh, the president on the putative powers of Congress to limit presidential powers, uh, and many other things uh, pertaining to the uh, discussion today. Uh, Bertrand Ross, Chancellor's Professor at the Law School, Educated, as I recall, Princeton, Yale, London School of Economics. He clerked at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals before coming here. He was at Columbia before. Uh, teaches, uh, among other things, um, electoral and constitutional law. He's been particularly interested in the question of the marginalization of the poor and working, working poor in relationship to the political process uh, in the U.S. And finally, uh, Sarah Anzia is a political scientist here, uh, she is the uh, Schwartz Professor of Public Policy and Political Science. Uh, she's um, written a very important book on the timing of elections, uh, off-cycle elections, and the significance that that has for who votes and how many people vote. She's written extensively on public sector unions, on gender in American politics, etc., etc. Uh, so we have, in short, three uh, fantastic people who are going to walk us through electoral manipulation. Uh, we're going to begin with uh, Eric, uh, followed by Sarah, followed by Bertrand. Um, after we've gone, heard everyone speak, what I typically do is to open up to questions, observations, uh, condemnations, whatever you feel is appropriate. Uh, I'll take usually two or three of them, three or four questions, throw them back to the, uh, the speakers, and they can improvise in whatever ways they, they see fit. And we should be done usually around 1.30 or thereabouts. Eric. The floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm really glad to see this new series that Matrix has started, of Matrix on Point. I think it's a great way for Matrix to bring different disciplines together with students and the community to think about important questions in our politics and society. So this is great. Uh, pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk uh, in a kind of general way about electoral uh, manipulation for you. Uh, this is not my, you know, it's an interesting frame for a topic. It's not how political scientists tend to frame the question in, in a lot of ways. Uh, it says something about political science, perhaps. Uh, but I'm gonna, so I'm going to start out with a kind of simple framework. And a two, I initially had two simple framework, but then decided to just call it a simple framework, which is, you know, our sort of normative ideal is that there's some mapping of citizen preferences into election outcomes, right? That's what we want, you know, where election outcomes are determined by citizen preferences. But there are always going to be distortions that limit that translation or affect that translation. And the focus today in the frame is about what you might think about as deck stacking strategies or manipulation where you're trying, where one side or the other is trying to get an outcome different from what we would have seen based just on those citizen underlying citizen preferences. It's also important to note though that if you think about elections, in addition to intentional efforts to manipulate, you also have something that you can think of as kind of built-in distortions. And what I mean by built-in distortions, I'll talk about it in a little bit more de detail in a moment, would be things that are outside the control of political actors, at least in the short term. In other words, things that affect this translation of preferences into outcomes, but that aren't being decided on in the context of this election by one party or the other, for example, saying, we're going to do this. These are kind of pre-existing distortions. And so let me, 
Uh, and I should note at the start, I think we should really think of this as a continuum rather than a sharp dichotomy, but I think it's still helpful. Uh, so let me give you some examples of built-in distortions in American politics. One is the use of single-member plurality rule districts. The fact that members of Congress are elected uh, from a single constituency, where whoever gets the most votes in that constituency is elected. We'll see that that can introduce on its own some important distortions between underlying distribution of preferences and outcomes. Another would be uh, Senate malapportionment. The fact that every state has two senators means, of course, we all know California, with its population that's 70 times the population of Wyoming, has the same representation in the Senate. And if you think about the nation as a whole, that's going to distort the tr translation of preferences into outcomes. The electoral column, you know, we've all, we saw in 2016 how that worked. Um, you can also think, and this might be a little bit more controversial, but you can think about voluntary, I, I put this in quotes, you can think about abstentions from voting. And, and the reason I put voluntary here is these are abstentions from voting where essentially the other things we're going to talk about later, things like voter suppression, um, voter ID laws, and so on, are not the reason these individuals are, are not voting, right? And, and so, um, now, it's, it's worth noting, each of these reflects a policy or political set of decisions that are made, and so in some sense, they're manipulated too. But one kind of overriding finding from political science has been that, at least until recently, when you think about these distortions, the actual net effect in terms of biasing that initial translation of preferences into outcomes, the partisan and ideological impact of that has been surprisingly limited. And I'm going to say, until recently. And, and let me just show you a kind of one cut at this. There are a couple different ways to think about this. But the first one we talked about was this problem of malapportionment and single member districts. And so this graph shows, uh, is a graph of what you can think of as pro-Republican bias in House and Senate districts from 1952 to 2016. Here's the idea. We look at the president's share of the, the Democratic Party's share of the popular vote in the country as a whole is a measure of partisan support overall. So let's say the Democrat gets 50% of the popular vote nationally. Then we ask, what share of the vote did, that, did the Democratic presidential candidate get in each congressional district? And it turns out that across all our elections from 1952 to 2016, a Democrat who got 50% of the popular vote nationally got less than 50% in the median district, in the typical district. Right? You might ask why, and similarly in the Senate, if you arrange by states, if the Democrat won 50% of the popular vote nationally, the Democrat would get a little bit less than 50% in the median state. If you just arrange all states from the lowest vote share to the highest and ask what's the median, the middle value, it would be less than 50%. Right? So there's all, in other words, there's been a bias in the Republican Party's favor in that translation from 1952 to the present. Second thing to note, though, is until recently, that bias was relatively modest, right? And it bounced around. In some years, it's close to zero. At the height, it's about, it's typically about one point, right? One percentage point. So there is a bias, but note, it was not big enough, for example, to prevent Democrats from controlling the House of Representatives every single year from 1954 to 1994, right? Or winning it back in 2006. Didn't prevent Democrats from controlling the Senate in most elections. Right? But it was still there. Now look at what happens, starts to happen in 2012, and then look at 2016. We're talking about almost a six-point gap, right? So this is essentially Hillary Clinton doing much better in the popular vote than she did in the median congressional district or the median state, right? And we'll talk about the reasons for this happening in a, in a little bit, but this is, a, this is something that we might worry about. Right. Second kind of built-in or potentially built-in distortion I talked about was abstentions, non-voters, uh, the fact that people are not voting who otherwise you know, could be voting. And again, this is something that for a long time uh, observers said, wow, if everybody voted, our election outcomes would be much different than they are. But when political scientists looked at this, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago in a kind of systematic way, the general result was Yes, non-voters are on balance a little bit to the left of voters, but the gap is relatively small and varies quite a bit across states 
Uh, and so this was a study that I actually co-authored uh, with a couple colleagues here at Berkeley where we essentially tried to, we looked at the um, estimated preferences of voters and non-voters in every Senate race from 1994 to 1998. And what we found was on average there was about a two point difference. I think it was about 1.8 point where um, on average non-voters were about 1.8 points more Democratic. And we simulated how many outcomes would that change and it turned out it changed surprisingly few outcomes, right? Because most Senate races simply weren't that close. Uh, um, so, um, so, so this has been a kind of conventional, which so the bottom line of this, I think, is the conventional wisdom of political scientists, at least until recently, is while these built-in distortions are real, they're not so substantial as to kind of fundamentally threaten democratic norms. I think that confidence now, especially in combination with electoral manipulation, is probably misplaced. Uh, and so, so one point I, I just want to make is these built-in distortions are now worse. And you might ask, why are they worse? There are kind of two big reasons. One is geographic polarization has gotten more serious. In other words, there's a much sharper urban-rural partisan split that exacerbates this districting advantage that Republicans have. And notice how, you know, the first thing people think of when they think about this distortion is gerrymandering. But if you go back to this graph, notice the Senate has the exact same pattern as the House. Right? The Senate's not gerrymandered every 10 years. It's, those map lines are fixed. What's going on? Democrats do extremely well in urban areas. They always have done well in urban areas. Well, not always. Since the 1930s, have done better than Republicans in urban areas. And it turns out if, you're, if your voters are very concentrated in one area, in urban areas, you tend to waste more votes. And so there are more districts, places, which are just overwhelmingly Democratic, whereas when you think about strong Republican areas, they tend to be more like 60% Republican, whereas the strong Democratic areas are 90% Democratic, right? So think about California. Think about the vast, you know, think about the Senate races in California and how many extra votes, you know, Kamala Harris and uh, Dianne Feinstein are winning um, that are, that, and, and whereas you tend not to see that as much in Republican areas. So that's one reason. In terms of the turnout concern and difference in abstention, one of the things that we've seen is, um, until recently, age did not cleave by party. In other words, young voters were not distinctively Democratic. Now they are distinctively Democratic. And young voters turn out in a substantially lower race. In addition, a racial cleavage in voting has gotten more substantial. And in particular, the uh, growth in the Latinx electorate, where Latinx voters are increasingly Democratic, but have a disproportionately low turnout rate. Is, so, these, so in other words, if you replicated what we did 20 years ago, and folks who've done that, to some extent, show a bigger gap between voters and non-voters. That, that, that in, in other words, universal turnout would make a bigger difference. Though I think it's worth noting one exception to this that cuts against it, is Republicans have gotten stronger and stronger among low education white voters. And that's also a group that tends to turn out at a relatively low rate. And so just one cautionary note to, the, to folks who think all we have to do in a state like Wisconsin is increase turnout dramatically. There actually are far more low education white voters who didn't vote in 2016 in Wisconsin than there are, for example, Latinx and, and black voters in those states who didn't turn. So it's a little bit, uh, that's the one thing that cuts against this. But, uh, um, but it's also worth noting that these shifts will then, and we'll, we'll talk about this more, heighten the incentive for Republicans to engage in more aggressive manipulation strategies. Right? And, and, and so let me get into exa examples of electoral manipulation. All right, so a couple things that are kind of come to mind immediately would be gerrymandering. Uh, and so if you look in 2010, when the census was done, when after the census you have to redistrict, Republicans had disproportionate control over state governments and so were able to engage in gerrymandering. It's worth noting when Democrats have unified control, they gerrymander as well. Um, however, it's the case because Democratic voters are distributed in this problematic way, the, net, the amount of gain they're able to get out of that tends to be less than the amount Republicans can get. Uh, so that's one form of manipulation. Another is voter suppression, voter ID laws, purges of voter lists, limiting polling places, uh, leading to longer wait times. So there's an important study by Charles Stewart at MIT showing if you just look at how long individuals have to wait to vote, 
tends to be higher in areas with large numbers of black and Latinx voters, right? So that's, that would be an example of making it more costly to vote in a way that's going to likely bias outcomes. You can also think about felon disenfranchisement laws and then uh, systematic misinformation campaigns with or without foreign cooperation. Um, and I think it's worth noting, you can think about some of these things as working together. So if you think about how a misinformation campaign works, uh, one of the key things about American politics is it's very hard to get a Democrat to vote for a Republican or vice versa. But it might be easier to get a Democrat to decide not to vote. And so misinformation campaigns can often be designed to try to demobilize voters as opposed to necessarily persuade them. All right, so what does political science have to say about this? First point I'd make is, unfortunately, it's very hard to estimate the impact of most of these strategies. So the research that's been done is kind of limited. Uh, one area that folks have tried to study quite a bit are voter ID laws. And the early studies on voter ID actually showed pretty surprisingly modest effects, that on balance it didn't seem like voter ID laws were associated with lower turnout, either overall or among particular groups that we might want. Uh, more recently, there was a study that got quite a lot of attention by Zoli Hajnal and co collaborators at UC San Diego that claimed to find big effects, especially on racial minorities. Um, subsequent to that, though, there was a uh, critique of this by Justin Grimmer and a, another group of political scientists that basically argued that, um, that there are some serious methodological issues with that study. In particular, one of the key problems with these voter ID studies is it's very hard to get what's called validated vote data by race. So in other words, people tell you I voted or not, but getting data on whether they actually did is much harder. And even when you try to track it down, it tends to be that the, you're, there's a lot of error in the, in the, in the data. And so, so it's unfortunately, the bottom line of this Grimmer et al. study was essentially, we don't know. There could be a big range. It's, the range of potential effects is quite quite wide, and social science hasn't told us yet. Um, now, I, I point out there actually, let me pause for a moment and note, even if the effects are hard to know, that doesn't mean the laws aren't wrong in that, right, in terms of democratic norms. It's just we haven't shown what the effects are. Um, I think I'd also like to point out that a deeper challenge facing such studies are that civil rights groups may mobilize to counter voter ID laws. So if you work really hard to get people the ID they need and make sure they can vote, that may offset the effect in a given election, but will that activism persist in the future? And also note, it's, it's taking resources you could have used in one way and deploying it in another way, right? So it still is having an effect, even if we, in, an indirect effect, even if it's hard to detect it. Um, and then finally, a, a last point on voter ID is it's, it's worth thinking about whether there are interactive effects. So if e even if each particular intervention has only a modest effect, voter ID laws, polling place lines, and so on, is it the case that they add up to something larger? All right, I'm actually going to skip voter misinformation. We can come back to it. Uh, uh, but again, it's another area where, on balance, the political science evidence has, has tended to be skeptical of big effects. So my cautionary note would be, in very close elections, even small effects can matter. All right, but I want to actually spend the last bit of my time on why we should really worry about all this stuff, I think, despite these earlier political science findings. And the reason is that I think, given geographic polarization, these pre-existing, built-in distortions may interact with the manipulated ones in a way that creates a much bigger structural imbalance. Right? In other words, one party might gain durable control of national and many state governments despite significantly less support among the general population, right? And this is in part due to the growing Republican structural advantage in Senate and House maps, um, and at least for the moment in the Electoral College, right? Recall, Democrats won the popular vote all but one election since 1992, and yet lost the White House. Uh, in, in, in multiple times during that period, most recently 2016. I think it's safe to say Democrats need to win the popular vote by about three points to have about a 50-50 shot in 2020. Um, but also, as Republicans lean on increasingly on a shrinking base of white voters, the incentive to be aggressive in voter suppression will rise. And I think there's a, we've seen, we're seeing already an erosion of restraints on acceptable, 
acceptable strategies in this racially polarized party system? Do you hear people talking openly about making it harder for groups to vote, whether it's young voters or black voters or Latinx voters, in a way that echoes the Jim Crow South and is really something we hadn't seen in American politics out in, out in the open in this explicit way for quite some time. And I think it's quite possible this is only going to get worse. There's a self-reinforcing element and also a difficulty, uh, a resistance to cor correction. And I think, uh, um, and one point I'd highlight here is, is that, or two points, one is that as long as Republicans control at least one branch, They'll be able to block efforts to reverse any deck stacking. And then secondly, and I, think, I wouldn't surprise me if we're trial talking about the legal aspects of this, the Supreme Court may well prove, well, it's certainly proving uh, hostile to voting rights claims, and so is not a check in this way. All right, so last thing I want to talk about is, well, what can be done about this? How to think about that? And this recent events have led to a lot of political scientists to think about democratic backsliding, how does the resilience of democratic institutions. A famous book by Steve Levitsky and Dan Ziblatt, who are both actually students here at Berkeley, uh, now at Harvard, How Democracies Die, argues for the importance of norms of restraint in maintaining democracy. And they basically argue that, yes, uh, we may be in a situation where Republicans are eroding, acting in ways that violate democratic norms, but if Democrats copy that, it's just going to lead to a vicious cycle, which in comparative cases, has been shown to lead to even bigger democratic breakdowns. I think the, the argument I want to make is that that this that in the current context, simply abiding by existing norms is probably not going to work. Yet at the same time, completely ignoring any norms is also going to be problematic. And so the real challenge is how do you defend norms of liberal democracy? in a situation where one party has an incentive and at least the capacity to act in ways that undermine it. And I think that's a hard problem that people are only starting to think about. And the little bit of the tidbit I will give you on how I'm thinking about this is basically to ask the question, if a window of opportunity opens, and by window of opportunity it would mean Democrats winning the White House and controlling, presumably by a very slim margin, the Senate and controlling the House, what should they do? How should they think about it? And the way I would think about it is they should really prioritize one or two initiatives that counter these structural disadvantages that they face. And I would prioritize that over any specific policy. Because if you don't change the structure, the long-term policy map is just going to get worse and worse for you. So the two things I would point to are probably D.C. and Puerto Rican statehood and voting rights protections, electoral reform particular with the House passed H.R. 1, which we could talk about in the Q&A, seems like a good model for that. Now, I think it's worth noting, this would be ending the fil The only way you could accomplish this is to do away with the filibuster, which Levitsky and Ziblatt would say is a violation of a norm, because they would have to do it by going nuclear, by violating the pre-existing rules. But I would argue that in this case, at least it would be in service of reforms that are democracy promoting rather than democracy <coughs> promoting, and that that's that given the situation we find ourselves in, I think that is probably a worthwhile, that is a worthwhile trade-off. Uh, and then again, though, it's worth noting, this means potentially sacrificing some real policy goals in the short term. Uh, the experience we've seen is when Democrats do get unified control, they can basically do one or two big things, and then it, and at most. And so have to think really hard about what those are. And I think given these structural considerations, this is how I, I at least would Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so I confess I struggle with the topic. Uh, I, I think I approached Eric last week and said, what is election manipulation? So I, I spent some time thinking about this um, and considering what to say. And uh, on the one hand, I kind of know what we're talking about. Um, say election manipulation. Uh, we've heard a lot about things like polling place closures in Arizona in the South, uh, resulting in long lines to vote, uh, deterring people from voting, and gerrymandering the Electoral College. And so and I think that wonder, what underlies all this is, number one, the sense that this stuff really matters. It makes a difference. It makes it harder for people to vote. Um, and number two, the, this is intentional somehow. Somebody's doing this on purpose. 
It was done to skew the results in somebody's favor. And if we were to have to make a guess at in whose favor things are being skewed, a pretty good answer would be Republicans. Okay. So I think my sense is that this is the kind of thing folks want me to talk about. Um, the problem is that this kind of stuff is a little too vague for me as a political scientist. Um, to, it sounds a bit like, well, we know it when we see it. Uh, and it also starts to take on this flavor of the Republican Party is the villain in the story of manipulating American elections. Now, I am not going to defend the Republican Party. Um, but I confess that this sort of vague way, we you know what we see it, way of thinking about election manipulation left me feeling adrift. So I turned to the examples from the email that went out for this event uh, to sort of help me think about what election manipulation is. So foreign, these are the things that were in the email. Foreign interference gerrymandering, voter suppression, the census, purging of voter registration logs, fake ballots, the malfunction and hacking of voting machines. And so I mulled this over, and in trying to get my bearings, I thought, well, let's group these things into categories, because really, these, these are kind of different things. The first is foreign interference. And unfortunately, I don't know much more about this than what I read in the Washington Post, so I'm not going to talk about this. Um, it also isn't clear to me that this is something that unambiguously helps the Republican Party. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. I'm not sure. Fake ballots, um, hacking of voting machines. I would call these things corruption. Is that fair? Um, strangely, election corruption hasn't really been a big topic in American politics research in um, the last I don't know, couple of decades. We know that there used to be a lot of this in the 19th century. There was a lot of election corruption. How much corruption is there in the U.S. today? Well, we don't know, really. There isn't much research literature on this. We study it in other countries. Um, but it's really difficult to study something that can't be tracked uh, or isn't going through formal, measurable challenge, uh, channels. So that's, that's what makes it hard. My hunch, if you ask me, that take this with a grain of salt I'm from Chicago. So I would say that there's probably a lot more corruption out there than we'd like to admit. Um, but we, we don't actually know how much there is now. We should probably do more to study this. But the rest of the stuff in that list that I put up there is, um, or it's implied by the list, can probably fall under two, uh, under this broad heading of electoral institutions. That's what political scientists would call it, electoral institutions. That's easier for me. Okay, I know what we're talking about now. How, and we need institutions. How do you run a government if you don't have rules for who gets to vote and how those votes get translated into positions of power and authority? We need institutions. Now, the fight happens over the nature of those institutions, what the rules are. Um, why? Because the rules have consequences. The rules affect who becomes a winner and who becomes a loser. And I teach a class to Masters of Public Policy students, and I have to somehow boil down all of American politics in about 10 weeks. And we have this whole class on how how you decide affects what you decide. The, the, the processes and the institutions affect the outcomes. So just think about voting. If you have a, de a decision rule for how um, you're going to vote and how a group of people is going to vote and aggregate those votes to make a decision, there's no best or perfect way of doing that. There just isn't. Um, there's no ideal to aspire to. And often, the way you do decide to do it affects the outcome. You if, if those involved know this and they can't anticipate how the rules will affect the outcomes, they will try to, they will try to affect the rules. Now, here's the thing. Um, if you try to understand why people are pushing for the rules that they're pushing for, they're not going to tell you. Right? That's the thing about election manipulation. We think they're doing something for a certain reason. But if you go interview them, they're not going to say, oh, yeah, I'm doing this because I want to win. Right? It's always couched in some argument about the public interest. Right? So this makes it really hard to understand, uh, from a social science point of view, why people are um, but the truth is, most of the time, they, they probably are thinking about what's going to help them win, what's going to help them get elected, what's going to help them put them in a position where they get to make policy. All right, so to make this just la this last category a bit more tractable, I think it's useful to separate the, the electoral institutions thing into two categories. One are um, these uh, this rules about who gets to vote, who does vote, things that affect turnout, and things that affect the composition of the electorate. So. Examples of this are voter ID laws, the purging of voter rolls, reducing polling places. This is probably where this term voter suppression fits in. Things that affect who votes and the composition of the electorate. Um, the second 
it, these are institutions that determine what, how those votes get translated into positions of authority. Right? So people vote in an election. We'll just take that as a given. How do you take all those votes and aggregate them to determine who gets to go sit in government and make decisions? So this is things like single member districts, gerrymandering, um, the electoral college, even census counts, because what's at play there is how, you know, is apportionment and how districts get drawn, um, and, you know, and how undocumented folks are counted. Um, so all of these things you can think of as uh, institutions that affect how votes get translated into positions of authority. So this was my way of making sense of this topic, uh, all by way of introduction. And moving, it's, it's a way of moving beyond the sort of vague notion of, hey, wait a minute, something's going on here, we know that uh, there are bad things happening in American elections, this helps to give us a bit of structure to it. But Now here's the thing, I, I, I struggled a little bit with this because I, I, I felt like I didn't have much to say about this. You're probably, I, if the question is, well, um, do elites, political elites, manipulate election rules to try to win? Yes. Yes, they do. I mean, I'm in complete agreement with probably what you're thinking. Are Republicans trying to draw districts to increase their number of seats in state legislatures and in Congress? Yes, they are. They absolutely are. Um, of course they want to do this. And Eric has given us a really nice overview of the ways in which that's happening, both the way they're, the ways they're doing it and ways in which the structure is favoring them and their ability and desire to do that. So it, I, instead I'm going to... In, in my, in my desire is to tell you about something you maybe haven't thought much about to get you thinking. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do that um, by thinking about a particular kind of electoral institution that maybe you've never considered. So it fits in this, this category. They affect who gets to vote, right? So things that affect turnout and the composition of the electorate. If you want to call it voter suppression, that's fine too. Um, so let, let me just start with this as a motivator. This is probably too small for you to see, but it's showing um, turnout rates in major national elections in different countries, and you can see that the U.S. is pretty far down there. It's about, you know, a third of the way from the bottom, um, showing that a lot of people who are eligible to vote, this is from Pew, they do not vote in even presidential elections. Um, of course, a big share of that is people who are not, is because of registration, right? A big part of what's going on, low turnout rates in the United States, even in national elections, has to do with registration. Uh, you know, we make it very hard for people to register and stay registered. Um, this is especially hard on movers. Uh, if you're in the U.S., it, you lose your registration if you move. And when you move, let's be honest, you have other things on your mind. And movers tend to be young and upwardly mobile. So if we think about, again, now the increasing partisan difference between young, younger people and older people, registration has an impact on that. Um, okay, so I think beyond that, I like to, why do we care about this? Why do we care about low participation rates in the U.S.? You might assume, of course, you might say, of course we do. But just to make it clear, two reasons why you might care. One is that you think uh, political participation, high political particip participation is a goal in and of itself. That this is something we should aspire to. There's something about high participation that confers legitimacy on government. Um, and when everyone participates, that's a good thing. And we're troubled by low participation. But there's a second category of reasons which has more to do with we fear that low political participation has an impact on outcomes, on policy and political outcomes. We feel like if everyone participated, we would get different policy outcomes. We, maybe we wouldn't care if only half the people voted if those people had the same preferences and would make the same choices as those who did it. But that's probably not the world we're living in now, right? The people who don't vote look quite a bit different than the people who do and have different priorities and preferences. So this leads to the obvious expectation that the different sides will care about turnout as either enhancing or detracting from the, their likelihood of winning or getting what they want. So that means one group of people might benefit from higher turnout because that tends to increase the proportion of their supporters. It also means another group of people is more likely to win with lower turnout because that increases the proportion of the electorate that has their preference. So that, I mean, that's really the essential thing. And from what I have seen, most people it, it talk, wax eloquent about this first thing. We just want high participation. But when it comes to real politics and what people are actually doing and what motivates them, I think it's more about the second. You know, it's more about we're trying to win and we're trying to increase our chances of doing so. Um, they want power. They want authority. You can all, almost always make arguments about how your institution is better for democracy than the other. Um, but you have to look beyond that to see what people's motives are. 
Okay, so I want to admit that the, I'll admit that most of the time, where we are right now in the U.S. is a place where electoral institutions that increase turnout tend to help Democrats. Right? Why? Because as turnout declines, you tend to see a higher proportion of um, older people, people with more education and income, fewer racial and ethnic minorities, so whiter electorates, and this generally means more conservative and more Republican. But I guess what I want to propose is this, this has a very national-centric flavor to it. Like that we're talking about national politics when we say these things. Um, and when we talk about politics, we're usually talking about national politics. But let's be clear here. We have 50 states, almost 90,000 local governments, and they make really important policy decisions. Just think about what Governor Newsom was talking about a week or two ago, right? Homelessness. So when it comes to housing and homelessness, a lot of the key decisions are happening in local governments, right? Local government. We should, if we want to understand what's going on, we need to be looking at local elections and local policy decisions, even though this is a nationally and statewide salient issue. The second thing, example is police reform. How police treat the accused. Okay, you probably care about this. I do. These are police departments are in local governments. This is mostly something happening at the local level. It's Super Tuesday. Our next president is probably not going to take on either of these issues. All right. So if you're worried about turnout in national elections, you should be really worried about turnout in local elections. Okay? Turnout is much, much lower in local elections. And that's because most local elections are held on entirely different days than national elections. So. We think of Election Day as the Tuesday after the first Monday in November of even number years. Right, that's when Congress and most state legislatures and the presidential elections happen. Most local elections are held on other days, and turnout in these off-cycle local elections is really low. Okay? California has been gradually moving toward on-cycle local elections, um, but I did a study that makes it clear what a difference this election concurrence makes to turnout. So in California, if you take the average turnout in an off-cycle election, we're talking about 26% of registered voters in municipal elections. It goes up as that local election is held concurrently with these elections that attract higher turnout. So if you, just looking at the last point, if you take a local election and you put it on the same day as a presidential election, turnout in that local election increases by 35 percentage points on average. It's not just mine. There are several studies that find the same thing. School board elections is the same thing. So while we're talking about voter ID laws, which, again, are troubling, and it, we don't know what effects they have, we know that the effects are much, much smaller than 35 percentage points. So this has probably got to make a difference. All right. So um, the other, one thing we do know is that what happens in off-cycle local elections, I'll just start with this one, is that the electorates tend to be older. This is taking all the cities in California and comparing the share of the actual voters in the election who are 65 and older and showing you the distribution. What you see in the green distribution is cities that have on-site elections tend to have a much smaller share of seniors in the electorate than cities that hold uh, off-cycle elections. Right? So <coughs> off-cycle elections mean much lower turnout and much older electorates as well. But I think we spend too much time talking about demographics and not enough about what those demographics actually signify in terms of policy preferences. Let's just think about what happens when turnout is as low as 26%. You might be asking, who is actually voting? Right? Who shows up in a city council election when there's nothing else on the ballot? The people who really care about the election outcome show up. The people who have a vested, a big stake in that outcome. Many are members of interest groups. And the groups that really care about those election outcomes are going to have an easier time mobilizing supporters and being <coughs> active in that low turnout election than um, they would in a higher turnout election. Okay, you're probably thinking, when is she going to get to the election manipulation part? Right, so here it is. All right. This, the reason I raise this is um, you might be asking, well, who decides? Why do we have all these elections off cycle? Why is this happening? Um, well, the state legislatures make the rules. Some of this has been in place for a long time. Um, but then I'm going to start by telling you a story about South Dakota. South Dakota. Back in 2001, there was a member of the South Dakota legislature who proposed a bill that would require cities and school districts to hold their elections on the same day. Just a technical thing. On the surface, this was technical, but um, members of the uh, House in South Dakota debated the bill for a long time, and there were weird things happening in that debate. You have Republicans 
supporting incre in increasing turnout in local elections. They want to combine these elections to increase turnout. Here's a quote from one Republican uh, member of the legislature. I believe that when we really have representative government, it's when we have the greatest possible turnout that we can. The most, more people that turn out, the more you really have the people speaking and who they want to serve them. We need to encourage a better turnout when we have elections. Most Democrats oppose this bill that would increase turnout in local elections, and the bill went down. Okay, um, so it's pretty weird. This is not specific to South Dakota. I did an analysis of bills of this type across the country over an 11-year period. What you tend to see is that bills that would consolidate local elections and increase turnout in local elections tend to be sponsored and supported by Republicans and opposed by Democrats. So what's going on here? Well, um, I'll skip the Michigan example, um, but I'll tell you what's going on. So for years, um, What's happened in, for example, let's just take local school boards as an example. School board elections are often held off cycle. Well, who's active in school board elections? Well, it, there is research that shows that one of the most active groups in school board elections are teachers and school employees and their organizations, okay? It shouldn't surprise you, of course. It's education at stake. It's, it's, the, it's the district that employs them, um, and they care about education. All right, so generally speaking, my research, my research shows that teachers and school employees do tend to do better and fare better in school board elections that are held off cycle. Why? Because they really care about the outcome and they make up a greater share of the electorate when turnout's low. And they're organized and they're active in these elections and all of the things they do in these elections have a bigger impact when turnout is low. How does this relate to South Dakota? Well, we know that teacher unions at the state level and national level align with the Democratic Party. So of course, state Democrats are gonna end up supporting off-cycle local elections, school board elections, because that benefits their group constituency. And Republicans who are opposed to that constituency suddenly become these champions of high turnout, right? Not because they're champions of high turnout, but because they think that their folks are gonna have a better chance of winning under a different electoral structure. Why do I bring this up? It's not to you know, criticize either party or to call them hypocrites. It's, it's, it's just to say, first of all, that uh, most of what we think of election manipulation pits these pro-manipulation Republicans against anti-manipulation Democrats. Most of that looks like that. That's just the way things are structured. Now, it's not because Democrats are more small d democratic, right? It's not in their souls that they're just committed to more participation or because they're the virtuous party and Republicans are this evil entity out there. It's because in many ways now, higher turnout increases their chances of winning, right? Um, and their interest is in winning. We start to see those motives when we look at this weird case where the situation is reversed. The second reason I bring this up is that our discussions of elections and election manipulation are very focused on national politics. We talk a lot about a national electoral institutions. Here are local institutions that affect local elections in a very, very big way. And we should really think hard about how the structure of local politics and local elections affect problems like housing supply, homelessness, police reform, which we all care about, which are important to us all in our day-to-day -day lives um, and deserve more attention than they currently get. Thank you. Hey, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. I'd like to commend my co-panelists um, on their thoughtfulness and discipline with staying on topic. Um, in law, um, you know, I'm not quite as thoughtful. Um, I see that it's a topic on elections. I teach election law, so I must have something to say about it. And the manipulation, not sure, sounds bad. My students say my class is depressing, so I must have something to say about that. Um, and But overall, about 18% of law um, academic panelists stay on topic. Um, and it's kind of ironic because lawyers in the courtroom have to stay on topic, but I think legal academics are the escapist, um, self-selected bunch that didn't want to stay on topic, and so we chose this particular profession. Um, so I won't really necessarily say the term election manipulation probably again, um, during my presentation, but I do think that there is something to be drawn and related to that particular topic and what I have to say. In fact, I'll talk about lawyer suppression to begin, but then I'll switch to something that 
um, I care quite a bit about, which is the political mar marginalization of the poor. Okay. okay, so on July 10th, 2012, Attorney General Eric Holder gave a speech at the annual convention for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In the year leading up to the speech, seven states had made moves to adopt strict photo ID requirements for voting. Republicans who controlled every state legislature that adopted voter ID laws justified them on the basis of mostly unsubstantiated assertions of voter impersonation fraud and concerns about the perception of fraud that these defender of voter ID laws said undermine the integrity of elections. Now, the day before Holder's speech, a trial began in the federal district court where the state of Texas was seeking a declaratory judgment against the Department of Justice to secure preclearance for its voter ID law under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Now, in his speech, Holder referred to the Justice Department's finding that the Texas voter ID law would be harmful to minority voters. Holder noted how, under the proposed law, concealed handgun licenses would be acceptable forms of photo ID, but student IDs would not. And he described how many of those without IDs would have to travel great distances to get them, and some would struggle to pay for the documents they might need to obtain them. Then, in an unscripted part of his speech, Holder announced, we call those poll taxes. This was not the first time that someone drew the analogy between voter ID laws and poll taxes, between new voter suppression tools and old, and it would not be the last. But the analogy is particularly noteworthy coming from the chief law enforcement officer of the United States and the closest cabinet member to President Barack Obama. As a result, Holder's speech and his analogy between voter ID laws and poll taxes drew considerable attention. Conservatives expressed outrage about the analogy with the Wall Street Journal editorial accusing Holder of playing the race card to drive up black turnout in a presidential election only five months away. Many liberals applauded the Attorney General and repeated the analogy describing voter ID laws as modern day poll taxes and literacy tests. In some respects, this analogy between new and older voter suppression makes sense. The new voter suppression, like the old, has as its goal, in effect, partisan electoral advantage. In the post-reconstruction redemption period, Democrats used the old voter suppression tools to secure partisan advantage over Republicans and populists just as Republicans over the last decade have sought and probably successfully used voter suppression tools to secure partisan advantage over Democrats. But in a critical other respect, overlooked by many who rely on the analogy, the old voter suppression is quite different from the new. The old voter suppression involved the effective disfranchisement of an entire class of voters. The post-redemption era cumulative poll taxes, literacy and understanding tests, white primaries, disfranchisement laws, and other legal devices reduced black voter registration and voting to a level where black votes could not exercise, black voters could not exercise any influence over elections to secure any representation in the political process. These older voter suppression tools imposed a nearly impossible to surmount barrier for African American voting and effectively disfranchised African Americans until the adoption of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Now, although there is certainly evidence that some proponents of new voter suppression are motivated by racism, and perhaps would not mind at all if African Americans and other racial minorities were effectively disfranchised, the new voter suppression tools have not come close to disfranchising an entire class of citizens. If we focus on racial minorities who are at the center of the public debate and legal controversy surrounding the new voter suppression laws, we see that the laws have had, at least according to current studies, only a marginal effect on turnout when compared to the old voter suppression tools. This distinction between the new and older old voter suppression is not meant to condone voter ID laws or any of the other new voter suppression tools. It's also not to, to, meant to dismiss their effects as barriers to voting for the non-trivial number of people who cannot afford the costs associated with acquiring a photo ID or are hurt by the reduction in voting days or are purged from voter rolls. And finally, it is not to distract from our full agreement with the claim that the denial of the vote to anyone is a democratic harm that should be unacceptable in a self-governing republic. Instead, the point here is to illuminate an important distinction between the old and new voter suppression in hopes of shining light on something that the analogy between the old and new voter suppression unintentionally masks, the effect of disfranchisement of the poor. Now, in one important respect, the poor are similarly situated to the African Americans in the South following the adoption of old voter suppression tools. The turnout of the poor is at such a low level that they do not influence election outcomes, they are unable to secure responsiveness to their interests in the political process. This, for us, is the definition of effective uh, disfranchisement, and we think it represents one of the greatest defects in our um, system of representative government today. Now, let's turn, turn to the census data. There was a 30% reported turnout gap between persons in the top income quintile and persons in the lowest income quintile in the 2016 presidential election. 
Now, such a large turnout gap might seem to provide some supportive evidence for the claim that the new voter suppression tools, like the old, are effectively disfranchising a group of voters. But a problem with this conclusion arises when we look to turnout data from elections preceding the recent spate of voter suppression laws. For example, in 2000, the 2004 presidential election, the last presidential election before Indiana and Georgia became the first states to require photo IDs to vote in presidential elections, the turnout gap between the rich and the poor was actually higher than it was in 2016. In fact, a persistent 25 to 35% uh, reported turnout gap between the highest and, and lowest income classes has persisted since the census started collecting reported voting data by income class in 1964. Preliminary results from um, our, I'm speaking of me and my co-author, um, statistical analysis confirms that voter ID laws have had only a minor effect on turnout by the poor, which is consistent with other empirical findings as well. Thus, while voting rights advocates and democracy scholars have identified the new voter suppression as a voting rights issue of our time, it's perhaps less important than is conventionally assumed when it comes to non-voting by the poor. This non-voting by the poor matters as it is correlated with the complete non-representation of the poor and the public process as found in recent studies by Martin Jones, Larry Bartles, and others. So why do the poor not vote? Now, we argue that to understand this, lawyers, legal scholars, and policymakers need to deepen their theoretical understanding of voting in the barriers to voting and draw from the um, insights and scholarship and theories from other disciplines. Now, to the extent that there is a theory in legal scholarship of voting, it is an implicit one that focuses on tangible cost barriers to voting as a primary determinant of voting. While we do not dispute the relationship between tangible cost barriers, such as poll taxes, literacy tests, and voter ID laws in voting, we argue that the focus on tangible cost barriers ignores other factors relevant to the voting decision that can explain, or at least partially, explain the effective disfranchisement of the poor. Rational choice and sociological theories of voting open up a host of additional explanations for why the poor disproportionately do not vote. In rational choice theories, information and the cost of such information is a critical determinant of voting. In order to vote, in order to vote individuals need basic logistical information about where, when, and how to vote. More importantly, to vote rationally, individuals need information about the differences between the candidates and how these differences might be relevant to their own well-being. To be able to differentiate between candidates, potential voters need to be informed about the candidates' past actions, policy proposals for the future, and how divergences between the candidates across multiple policy dimensions will differentially impact their well-being. Rational choice theory also identifies a person's degree of affiliation with formal organizations, another factor that influences turnout. Formal organizations, which include unions, churches, or professional associations, can positively influence the turnout of their members by providing members with tailored information that they need to differentiate between the candidates and relate these differences to their own well-being. Sociological theories have also found that formal organizations can instill within its members a sense of a duty to vote, particularly when the formal association stands to benefit from the election of one candidate over the other. Finally, integration to social networks of politically interested individuals is another factor found by sociological theories to influence the decision to vote. Like formal organizations, social networks of politically interested individuals provide members of these networks with valuable tailored information that informs members' voting decisions. Perhaps more importantly, social networks also are the source of social norms that embed within members of a sense of civic duty to vote. Now, in terms of information, formal organization affiliation, oops, sorry. Formal organization affiliation, the integration to social networks of politically inter interested individuals, the poor are at a disadvantage relative to members of other socioeconomic classes. As a general matter, the poor bear heavier information costs to voting because the poor tend to have lower educational attainment. A consistent finding in the empirical literature is a strongly positive relationship between education and voting. The more educated that a person is, the more likely she is to vote. And a reason for this relationship, consistent with rational choice theory, is more education lowers information acquisition and processing costs. Those with more education tend to know more about where to find sources of information relevant to the voting decision, and to have an easier time processing such information due to background knowledge acquired through schooling. The poor are also less likely to be affiliated with formal organizations. With the exception of churches, most formal organizations, such as unions and professional associations, exclude those without jobs or professional affiliations, who are likely to be poor. Finally, the socioeconomic class homophilia of social networks, combined with the poor's lower educational attainment and their exclusion from most formal associations, leads to dynamic where the poor are often isolated from social networks that include politically interested and active individuals. Empirical studies have found that the difference between the rich and poor in information acquisition and processing costs 
affiliation with formal organization and integration of social networks contributes to this um, um, to this rich voter <coughs> turnout disparity more than the tangible costs of voting. Now, what we've identified now that we've identified some of the more important sources of turnout in our opinions, the question then is what can be done to ameliorate these sources of disparity. Now, first best solutions might include improving educational opportunities for the poor, providing the poor with the necessary time and resources to integrate themselves into formal organizations and social networks. But these first best solutions appear unrealistic in the current political context, where there is politi little political will for massive public investment into poor communities. We must therefore look to second best solutions to redress the rich poor turnout disparity. To identify these second best solutions, it is important to understand the critical role of political party mobilization of activities in individual decisions to vote. Political parties' door-to-door -door canvassing and phone banking positively influence the voting decision in two ways. First, campaigns through their mobilization activities provide potential voters with information, sometimes tailored information, that helps them differentiate between candidates and relate these differences to their well-being. Second, campaigns through their mobilization activities impart individuals with a sense of civic duty to vote. Experimental studies show that campaigns are quite successful in positively influencing the vote decision. According to these studies, door-to-door -door canvassing increases turnout by approximately 7 to 10 percent, and quality phone banking that is more tailored to the audience increases turnout by about 5 percent. It is not only these direct mobilization effects that matter. Other experimental studies show that mobilization has a contagion effect and that it indirectly mobilizes those in the social networks of the contacted person. One study found that this contagion effect increases the probability of turnout for live-in partners by about 60%. Although COP campaigns have a positive turnout effect on voters, their activities have likely only exacerbated the turnout disparities between the rich and the poor. Campaigns are subject to budget constraints that are equal to the sums of the contributions received from donors and whatever the candidate contributes from his own or her own wealth. These budget constraints prevent campaigns from contacting everyone. Campaigns therefore seek to use their money efficiently to mobilize as many favorable votes as possible in hopes that those voters will, votes will be enough to win the election. To most efficiently use their money, campaigns employ what we label a calculus of contact as a tool to efficiently use their money. In this calculus of contact, campaigns decide who to contact by assessing the probability that the individual will vote as a result of the contact and the probability that the individual will vote favorably for the candidate. In employing this calculus of contact, the campaigns use a variety of mobilization strategies depending on electoral context. These strategies range from a base mobilization strategy in which they focus their energy on contacting moderate to frequent voters that are highly likely to support the candidate, to a conversion mobilization strategy in which they target moderate to frequent voters that range from being undecided to weakly supported with the candidate, of either candidate. A consistent element in most campaign mobilization strategies is the inattention of two infrequent voters who do not have much of a voter history, voting history. Campaigns tend to avoid these individuals on the basis of a prediction that these individuals are less likely to vote if contacted and due to the uncertainty about probabilities related to how they might vote if they are contacted. This tendency to avoid infrequent voters is reflected in this series of heat maps that show who three different Democratic presidential campaigns contacted in Ohio over three presidential cycles. We see in these heat maps a range of strategies employed by Kerry in 2004, Obama in 2008, and Obama in 2012. Notably, the red portion of the heat map, which indicates a lower level of intensity of contact, tends to be concentrated among low turnout voters. What we do know about these infrequent voters, what do we don't know about these infrequent voters? Well, we know that they tend to be poorer and younger than the average voters, and also are more likely to be Latino. Given the positive turnout effect that mobilization has, the decision by campaigns to neglect these low turnout voters is a form of political anti-mobilization. We argue that the disparity in turnout can be reduced as a way to com combat political anti-mobilization. We argue that a key to combating political anti-mobilization is changing campaigns' information environment. What we mean by this is that we need to change what information is available to campaigns when they're assessing the probabilities in their calculus of contact. And there are at least three possible strategies for changing campaigns' information environment. The first strategy is to make less information about potential voters available to campaigns. Now, this strategy seeks to be responsive to campaigns' use of micro-targeting, in which they collect tons of information about potential voters from the state and private data vendors to construct more precise predictive measures of probabilities and use those measures to decide, to decide who to contact. Prior to 2008, geographic precinct mobilization was a dominant campaign mobilization strategy. Under geographic precinct mobilization, campaigns would decide on which precincts to canvas on the basis of aggregate turnout 
and voting data and try to contact everyone in the precinct. But since 2008, micro-targeting has emerged as a newly dominant mobilization strategy in which the campaigns more selectively target specific households and even people within those households. The 2004 um, Kerry campaign in Ohio engaged in this more geographic precinct mobilization, while Obama in 2012 engaged in more micro-targeting uh, and more micro-targeting in 2008 involved a mix of the two. From the heat map, it is clear that micro-targeting resulted in less, less contact with low turnout voters. If the state imposed restrictions on what information campaigns can receive from both the state and data vendors, it would constrain the ability of campaigns to micro-target in the ways that they are doing right now. The problem with this strategy, however, is that it will likely result in campaigns shifting to geographic precinct mobilization, and it's hard to constrain private data vendors from distributing information. There are First Amendment concerns that arise around it, um, and it's not clear that governments can do that. So a second strategy is making more information about potential voters available. States can make more information available to campaigns through the adoption of an automatic voter registration system. Under the most common automatic voter registration system, persons are automatically registered to vote whenever they come into contact with an agency designated by the state. The state sends the, then sends the individual a letter, providing the person with the opportunity to opt out, and also gives the individual an opportunity to express her party preferences. In order for an automatic voter registration system to improve the information available to campaigns in a way that might incentivize them to contact, contact poor voters, it is critical that states obtain as much information about individuals' party preferences as possible. This may require the states to be more proactive in sending a letter. It may instead require the state to contact individuals by phone or even engage in door-to-door -door contact to collect information about the partisan preferences of these newly registered voters. In this new, fuller information environment in which campaigns have more information about the partisan preferences of low turnout voters, they face less uncertainty about how they might vote if contacted, which may increase campaigns' incentives to contact these individuals. But there is still a problem of campaigns knowing individuals' voting histories, which may lead campaigns to continue to focus their energies on frequent voters because of doubts about whether infrequent voters will vote at all if contacted. So a third strategy, which is one that we support right now, is to both make information more and less available. More information about the partisan preferences of individuals through automatic voter registration tools and active um, state contact of individuals, and less information in terms of not uh, um, of states holding back the distribution of voter history. Now, one thing that's important, it's only the state that has information about individuals' voter history. And it's only the state that can distribute this information since they control um, uh, um, the information about who comes to the polls. So it's within the state's um, domain um, to be able to hold um, back um, these voter, this voter, uh, voter history of individuals. And that may sort of create the right incentives in which campaigns are targeting um, individuals based on partisan preferences while um, discounting the value of voter history since they will lack that information. Now, in the future project, and this is where I'll conclude, um, involves sort of questions in which we have a variety, a variation in terms of what information states make available to campaigns. And we see here there are 16 states that do, that do not distribute voter history information to, to campaigns. And one of the questions that we are exploring is, is the contact gap, which is the gap between um, um, uh, party com campaign contacts of rich and poor um, individuals, does it vary um, um, by states according to the different information environments in these states? That's something we're trying to get at in our future study, um, and um, and happy to explore questions about that in the Q and A. Thank you. Uh, so my question is mostly to uh, Professor Schickler because of the data you've studied, and I would like your opinion on. It seems to me the big question we're hearing uh, in the Democratic primary: uh, two arguments. One side says we need someone who can energize the base, like Bernie. Uh, or we'll lose. And the other side says we need someone who can bring out those white collar Wisconsin, Pennsylvania voters because that's where the election will be won. Uh, so we need someone more centrist like a Joe Biden. Uh, would you like to weigh in on that? <laughs> Based on data, I've heard millions of people's hunches. So, I mean, I think. Eric, would you mind if we, if we take a couple of questions? I'm not getting you off the hook here. Believe me. Uh, Let's take a couple more. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I would love to hear your reflections on the news last week that according to intelligence officials, there are foreign parties interested in advancing both Trump and Bernie. And I was hoping to learn more about why they might have that strategy, or how they might pursue it, and whether it scares the daylights out of you. 
Yes, please. Um, two things came to mind during your presentation. One is that I don't know what agency it would be that would establish voter registration, which can be the DMV because everybody doesn't have cars. But couldn't we have the Australian model where we have mandatory voting and the fine is charged if there is if you don't vote? And the other question is for education, should civics be taught at the elementary, at the middle school level so that we have educated voters that come out of the uh, education process? Let me take one more and then I'll toss it back to the speakers. Yeah, Professor yes, Strickland, you didn't mention, you know, uh, issues around the Supreme Court selection uh, and changing that. Uh, I think Ziblatt, uh, in that book, they mentioned that as well. What is your view of that uh, possible change? All right, Eric, I don't feel like you have to mechanically go through every question, so improvise in whatever way you wish. Uh, Eric, you're... All right, um, so the... Um, so the so the last question on on the Supreme Court, though, I'd be curious what other folks have to say about this. I tend to be s skeptical on the practicality of court, you know, of expanding the court for two reasons. One, I'm doubtful Democrats could get 51 votes to do it, and and it's the kind of thing where the automatic response of Republicans as soon as they take over, to, and and they'll have greater opportunities to continue packing the court. So I think things like statehood that tip the balance. That's where I would put, put my. I do think the Supreme Court is going to be a huge problem for Democratic administrators. No, they could overturn statehood for D.C., for mm -hmm. example. Um, so it's no easy answers. Um, foreign interference. I. I mean, I. I don't know. I mean, I think we're all worried about it. I do think that the mass, you know, the chaos strategy that the Russia. I mean, it seems like that is in the idea of promoting Bernie. Whether it's because. They think he would lose to Trump, or because they think, you know, something out. You know, I don't know, but I think it, we have plenty of reason to worry. I think, but the poli sci. The good thing is high intensity elections. Okay, the one comforting thing out of the political science work on election on misinformation, is mostly the people who consume it most are hardcore partisans already. So the number of votes that change is very limited. The thing I do worry about, though, is you know. It, there's some people who believe, and I think there's some evidence for this, the concentration of, for example, ads about super predators with Hillary in black communities, ads about, you know, Spanish language ads targeting in the Latinx community. It's not going to get folks to vote for Trump, but does it demobilize individuals? I think, you know, I think there's at least that possibility. So, so I do think that's a real worry. Um, and then the, I would point your attention in terms of the outcome to the, a good study, a couple of Berkeley political scientists was a co-author, David Brockman, where they looked at basically what does it have, what has to hold for the Bernie theory to be right, what has to hold for the Biden theory to be right. And basically, bottom line is that the turnout increase you need for the Bernie theory to hold is of historic proportions. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a historic, you know, it's a big boost, an 11 point increase roughly in youth turnout. That's huge. Um, so whether, you know, I leave that to other people to judge, is that more likely or less likely, but that's, that's what it would take. Um, I guess I'll start with the um, foreign inter intervention and, and misinformation campaigns. And I'll say just kind of um, um, building off of Eric's point in that the targeted sort of, at targeting the African American and Latinx community with these, with this information campaign, I think is the most sort of threatening aspect of it. Um, I think that it, it, it can and perhaps has had a demobilization effect, which is uh, pretty harmful. And it builds um, long-term distrust in the political process, which is um, also particularly harmful. So that's what worries me. And the second thing that worries me is just the way that mainstream media amplifies um, that, the information that's mostly through social media channel, channels. And I feel that there's kind of too much, too much gap to fill in CNN news programming. Um, right now, um, even though there's a lot of things that are going on in the world, they feel like they only have the capacity to talk about two things at once. Yeah. And when they talk about those two things at once, they tend to kind of try to dig deeper and deeper, and the potential for amplification uh, becomes greater. And that was seen a bit in the Iowa caucus, right, in the sense that there's amplification of conspiracy theories that happens on media because they have time to fill. And so I, I worry about that aspect of it, too. Um, going to your point about sort of um, 
compulsory voting. It's something I've, I've thought about and kind of looked at quite a bit in terms of other contexts. Um, you know, I think compulsory voting is um, a step in the right direction. I, I do have sort of practicality concerns whether something like that could ever get passed in the United States or any state in the Union, and, and then whether it would raise First Amendment um, concerns with respect to compelled speech. Um, but then even beyond the pragmatic concerns, um, um, one of the concerns is that, you know, would it necessarily lead to more informed voting or would it lead to random voting um, by those um, individuals? I want to sort of keep the pressure on sort of information, information delivery institutions to provide and, and support and share information with um, individuals um, to encourage them to vote. Um, I think compulsory voting might be a little bit of a cop out. I don't, I worry in terms of what the effects might be in terms of, of the information institution um, delivery apparatus. Um, I would say in terms of how it works with automatic voter registration, it's supposed to go beyond the DMV, it's supposed to go to all public welfare organizations, any contact with the state is supposed to sort of automatically register you, and then you can opt out. Now still, there are some people that do not contact the state for for many long periods of time, um, but, um, but we'll see. The experiment is on in Oregon, right, in particular, California has a form of automatic voter registration voting in place. We'll see how much it captures, how much it can pick up, and what else we need to do to pick up the rest. And then the final point on civic education, I can agree with you more. And I think that um, combining it with the idea of lowering the voter voting age to 16 while people are in high school getting the civic education, and you build up that habit of voting at the very beginning, that could be a, a huge improvement that wouldn't raise constitutional concerns and could have a pretty good pickup um, um, in terms of voting in the future. Okay, I agree with what's been said. I just want to say a couple extra things. Um, I think the obvious answer to Nathan's question is that they think Bernie's more likely to lose against Trump. Right? So, um, I don't know if that's the case. Again, I don't know what American political elites are thinking. I definitely don't know what the Russians are thinking, but I think that's one plausible explanation for this. Um, and yes, it's terrifying. So then um, the, the question of uh, mandatory voting, I think you know, this is really tricky, that um, maximizing participation is one value, and you know, there are others. There is liberty, there are, and, and I think that this compulsory voting is just viewed by a lot of people as un-American, and it's unlikely to go very far in this country because of that. Um, and the last thing, I was going to mention the same paper that Eric just mentioned, uh, the same article on moderates versus more extreme candidates. And instead of repeating that, I'll just say that one, th one really interesting idea that comes up, and it came up in the, Eric's comments, um, in, and also a big part of uh, Jonathan Roden's new book uh, called Why Cities Lose, is that because um, there is a structural disadvantage where a lot of Democrats are concentrated in cities, whereas Republicans are more spread out in space, um, it creates a much bigger problem for the Democratic Party. So what, a lot of what we see in the Democratic Party is uh, we see in other industrialized democracies, you know, the fight for the soul of the left, which is exactly what we're seeing right now uh, in the Democratic Party. Do we, you know, does the Democratic Party moderate or does it, um, you know, become more progressive? And that structural setup really does sort of favor a more moderate Democratic Party, right? So if you can't you know, if your votes are concentrated, you kind of have to, to, to moderate in order to appeal to, to voters in a larger number of districts, which sort of forces you to moderate. So I think, you know, one other thing to think about in response to what Eric said, which is are we entering this new era where one party is at a structural disadvantage, is, well, maybe the parties need to, to change, right? So that's another thing that could happen, is that the parties have to adjust. That's certainly what the Republican Party has done in the last uh, four to five years. I don't think anyone was in charge of that effort. Certainly, if you go back to the you know, post-2012 Republican post-mortem, they were not saying we should come up with a Trump figure. They were saying we should pass you know, immigration reform and appeal to uh, you know, the Latinx population. That, that's definitely not what happened. But you know, that's another uh, factor here that is not fixed, um, that the, the party could adjust uh, to try to, to um, you know, get, gain a, an upper hand um, given these the geographic imbalance. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please. Um, third election cycle, um, the I'm very curious about what will happen if a candidate proceeds forward with a plurality rather than majority, as it definitely increasingly looks like we're going. Um, and then with regards to the role of superdelegates and moderating um, type and choosing like strategically a way to broadly appeal to the entire coalition. Do you think that's something that would end up demobilizing voters who perhaps, if they're inflexible in their, in 
will resent the idea that the party has this control in being able to moderate our choices. Let me just take a couple more questions. Sir, you had a Could question? you use a mic? Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Thank you. I'm curious about our neighbors in the north, sometimes known as Canada, uh, how they handle voter suppression or do they have it at all? Is it, is it a problem there? How do they deal with it? Um, I had a comment um, for uh, Mr. Ross. I, the, some of the things that you listed, hi. <laughs> uh, Actually, almost everything that you listed um, could be addressed by public libraries, and I was wondering okay. if you thought about um, some sort of look, reaching out to public libraries. I am a public librarian, as probably guessed, um, and I work a lot on uh, social justice issues, homelessness, poverty, all of that, and the role of libraries in addressing it. But your list is amazingly representative of what we do, so I was wondering if you thought about that. One more question? Yes. Uh, sorry. I heard uh, we have to win by 3%. That was shocking. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, so in other words, uh, that's 4.5 million. In other words, Hillary won by 3 million, and you say we have to win by, to be safe, we have to win by 4.5 million. And then the second question was about um, um, Bernie's campaign in Nevada got the young Latinx to convince the granddaddies to switch to Bernie? Is that new and did it work? Thank you, sir. Sir, would you like to begin with uh, <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything All right, I'll start with the plurality, small margins question. I think that's what that was about, that if you're winning by a little, does that somehow make people feel disgruntled or as though the, there's no mandate, they, they don't really, um, it's hard to know whether to attribute it to that or something else. Um, but what a couple, a number of things have happened. One is just the, the trust in government has plummeted. Right, it's been gradually declining for for decades, um, and I think that there are a number of reasons for that. But another thing that's happened at the same time is that um, there's a political scientist named Francis Lee who's um, done a lot of research on how what, what's happened now since the the 70s is that um, you know, control of government is in play for both parties, right? It's, it's something that is attainable. Whereas for a long time, you know, it seemed like, for example, the House wasn't in play for Republicans for a very, very long time. And so that, you know, the perception that we just need a little bit more in order to, to, have, to have authority to be able to make policy has changed the dynamic in politics a lot. Um, it's created incentives, she argues, um, to be more negative, to attack the party in power because you know that's going to help you get elected. Has really changed the tenor of politics, um, and may also have contributed to uh, this decline in um, trust in government as well. That's happened. So I don't know if that's it's not exactly on your question, but it's really. Um, and I'll say just kind of a, a brief sort of response to your question that, that if we if we do get to a democratic broker convention and we have a second round of voting with the super delegates, I think that the. Um, party's probably in trouble in the 2020 election because I think that there is a perceived, um, by one side at least, maybe both sides, that it's illegitimate, or at least for this election, maybe not so much last election, to take um, the superdelegates into account. Um, and so, you know, the supporters are going to be heartbroken and, you know, the question that they'll have is, is it more important to, you know, um, express my sort of dis 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 disappointment by not voting or to um, recognize that perhaps the biggest threat in their minds might be sort of another four years of the current president. Um, with respect to the, um, the point about um, libraries, um, that's absolutely right. And I think that sort of in terms of an uh, information delivery tool, libraries are quite important. I think that one of the things that I sort of think about is sort of how do we channel individuals to these information sources um, that they may not know sort of how to acquire um, or how to process. Um, and I think that one of the difficulties that has arisen is that, you know, partisan mobilization has picked up quite a bit, but there have been active efforts to suppress sort of nonpartisan mobilization. 
that could have that sort of empowering effect of sort of channeling um, individuals to the right source of information so that they can make sort of responsible choices and be sort of in, inspired or civically engaged um, to vote. And so, um, you know, can we sort of recover um, groups um, um, or replace groups like ACORN, who used to play a very important mobilization role? Um, legal women voters, can we sort of get them more active in states that they have been um, pretty, um, that they have been um, harmed in in terms of their mobilization activities? I think that that's a question in terms of channeling individuals um, to um, 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 to libraries as a, as a critical tool. Um, and I think there's another question directed at me, but I forget what it was. Um, but um, if you scream it out loud, I'll try to respond. Oh, oh, yeah, Canada, my favorite national anthem, just as a trip <laughs> um, But I, 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 I don't know in terms of what tools that they have um, I don't know in terms of whether the parties are similarly motivated to suppress a particular class of voters um, and whether it falls along sort of the socioeconomic race lines of, 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 of voting that we see in the United States, which may make them less sort of beneficial to a particular party in that particular context, but I'm not sure. Ditto on that last. It's a great question, but I wish I had more to say about it. Um, so in terms of, just real quick, in terms of the three points, I mean, that's a prediction. You know, that's my best guess, thinking about how the Democrats will amass bigger and bigger majorities in places like California. And the problem is they're making gains in places like Texas, but not enough to win. And therefore, the tipping point, it's, you know, the, my guess is it's about a three-point margin in order for Democrats to win in Arizona or win in Wisconsin, which is what they need to get to 270. In terms of your question, it's a great question, and the way I would think about it, one way to think about this is we have a situation, this is a, a formulation of a political scientist, Julia Azari at Marquette, where we have very strong partisanship, but weak parties. Parties aren't viewed as really legitimate, authoritative decision makers. We saw that in 2016 with Trump taking over the Republican Party in many ways. We're seeing a battle over exactly how weak is the Democratic Party. And the paradox is, it may be that the Democratic Party is strong enough to prevent somebody who's not a member from winning, but if they do that, and that person has the most votes and the most delegates, it won't be viewed as entirely legitimate by many people and will be, as Bertrand said, deeply problematic in the general election. So I think it's a really tough situation, but I think it reflects this much broader dynamic where voters are intensely partisan, but they actually do not, for the most part, trust their parties established party's leaders, their party leaders, and that's a deeper problem in our liberal democracy, I think. We are after the hour, but can I take one last question, if there is one, if not, uh, yes, ma'am. Just a quick question, uh, on the uh, over here, voter history inactive list, yeah. California's not listed, does that make a difference, because it would seem to me the parties would have prior history and they would just have to do the, put the data together. Yeah, so um, the so California is listed in the voter history partisan affiliation state. Um, um, what inactive list? I'm sorry, on the inactive list. On um, the inactive list. Um, you, yes. California doesn't provide party affiliation. Is that, is that, is that yes, it, it does. It does. But it oh, provides okay. both partisan affiliation and voter history. Um, but what I'll say, and, and just kind of going to the broader point, yes, parties have the voter history list from the states that have distributed the information of current voters, and you know they'll continue to have that list past this election, even if you stop the distribution of that information. But the idea is that over time, right, that information would become dated and less useful, and so therefore they would have to require rely on other sorts of information deciding who to mobilize which I think could be beneficial, but we'll, we'll, we'll let you know after we do some further analysis. Uh, please bring your hands together. Thank everyone for a great discussion.